I'm in this game because I'm a psychiatrist and I want to help patients, but also I'm in it because of the intellectual challenge. When you meet for the first time people with schizophrenia, they express views, beliefs, ideas, attitudes that you really don't come across mainly in daily life. These are complicated disorders. Other illnesses uh, they can benefit from confirming diagnosis by taking blood tests, doing x-rays, something objective. In psychiatry we have to rely just upon symptoms, clinical pictures, but we have known uh, for many, many years, decades, that a substantial contribution to psychiatric disorders, and schizophrenia in particular, is genetic. Recently, with my colleagues, we identified a whole number of new mutations in people with schizophrenia. Now, new mutations are those where a DNA change has happened in the person with the disease that is not present in either parent, so they haven't inherited the DNA in the traditional way. By doing this study, we probably got one of the first glimpses at a pathophysiological mechanism for schizophrenia. Well, I'm deeply honoured that, uh, that the work that we've been doing has been recognised by, by this award. I mean, it's, it's, it's great. I'm, I'm thrilled by this. I suppose what would be most important, really, uh, is answering a question in schizophrenia research that has a direct benefit for patients. I've been interested in psychiatric research really since I was a medical student. It seemed to me then, and it does now, that this you know, is one of the great challenges facing modern medicine. The genetics of schizophrenia has really been transformed over the past five years. Five years ago, we knew that the disorder is genetic. Now we have a wealth of evidence and telling us that really disorders like schizophrenia, the genetic component is very complex. It involves many genes, hundreds of different genes probably. What we want out of this work is to start to get a handle on the biology. What are the genes telling us about schizophrenia? And I think we're starting to get enough data that we can do that. And this is really very exciting and is I think beginning to tell us where in the brain we should look and it's actually where in cells we should look. And we feel that the, this, by discovering the, the, the genes, if you like, we're, we're priming this next stage of development and so, and we, so that we hope that in the future um, people will benefit through having new treatments. Well, it's a great honour to receive the Lieber Prize. I've been really delighted by it. Having the approval of your peers, of other distinguished scientists um, who are saying that you know, they admire your work, the best compliment that you can get in science. The question I'd most like to get the answer to over the next five years or so is really the, the extent to which schizophrenia is caused. I think there's going to be a lot more to come from genetics. We've only just got the tip of the iceberg. I was fortunate to get a NASAD Young Investigator Award in 2009 and it was really crucial in my development and I think in the emerging research findings that, that we're discovering. The most valuable thing at the moment I've been able to do is identify what is one of the largest samples of those with severe schizophrenia in the world and I think that's starting to lead to new findings. We've spent a lot of time in the last three or four years collecting clinical samples, so recruiting and interviewing people with schizophrenia um, to find out more about the condition with the ultimate aim then of linking genetic findings with these kind of symptom level findings. What I hope is is that um, with new and emerging findings we'll explain more of, of the genetics of schizophrenia and that will help us identify the pathways that go awry in the brain of those that subsequently develop um, the condition. If we can identify those pathways, then we can also look at the effects that those pathways going awry has on cognition and other symptoms. And that means that we may be able to, to have treatments specific to symptoms. I think 
in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, we won't be treating schizophrenia as a diagnosis in and of itself. We'll be treating spectrum of symptoms. And I think this, this research and the research approach, which I think um, I've followed and, and continue to follow, should help inform those kind of treatment developments. Memory is personal and it's evocative and it's related to nostalgia and history and it's a fundamental part of who we are. It's harder to think of anything much more exciting than studying the nervous system and the brain and how it works. What I'm interested in is systems neuroscience. The parts of the brain that we study are prominently the hippocampus, the area of the brain that's vulnerable to damage and chronic depression. So if we've made some small contribution to all this, it's in understanding something about how this system works, how this structure works, and what memory is. What we do primarily to get at that is to study patients who, because of an injury or disease, they've had damage to particular parts of the brain. The fundamental thing is that we know that memory is not a single faculty of the mind. Memory is composed of many different abilities that are supported by different brain systems. As one looks over the course of the history of the problem, we've come an enormous distance from not even knowing where these structures were or not even understanding what memory really is to having a sense of how to think about memory. We know a lot about the details of how these parts of the brain work, but on the other hand, we're really just at the beginning. We're always faced with the challenges of trying to understand an issue, trying to understand a problem. All of us who do basic science, I think, have the belief that what we're doing has the potential and eventually finding applications for health and disease. In my personal experience, what usually turns a researcher on is that curiosity and the joy of discovering. Finding a problem that is just so interesting that you're going to dedicate years, if not decades, to solving that problem. I run the program in neurogenetics at UCLA and the Center for Autism Research. The essence of the work that we're doing is we use modern technology and tools to understand the causes of neuropsychiatric diseases such as autism so that we can then treat them. There are a few things that I'm most proud of in terms of discoveries. One is defining the molecular neuropathology in the autism brain, that is the changes at the gene level that are occurring in the autism brain. The second is the ability to make a genetically engineered mouse and study it and show that it has autistic features. We can actually begin to treat social abnormalities caused by genes that predispose to autism in humans. We're in this time of extraordinary promise where we have the most extraordinary tools we've ever had. So funding is critical to push this forward. I really think we're on the precipice in a very positive way of really a totally new neuropsychiatry. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation is really critical in neuropsychiatric research. These kinds of awards and the kind of funding, especially to young investigators, is really remarkably important. When I started working in autism, I never imagined that we'd have the amount of progress that we have now. It gives me hope that we can even do more. The most exciting thing is when you know you have the eureka moment in the lab, you find the gene, you understand something new that hasn't been seen before. You know, those moments are priceless. I'm a child psychiatrist and a human geneticist. I see patients and I run a laboratory that is focused on identifying the causes of autism, Tourette syndrome, and other childhood uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. As I started taking care of kids um, with serious psychiatric illness, it became clear how little we knew about these complex disorders. And the disorders are very complex. They've been very frustrating because of the level of complexity of the brain. 
The idea from the start as a clinician was to use genetics as a window into the biology of the disorders and we're finally I think making significant progress. What we're trying to do is specifically to identify genes that contribute to these disorders. So if we can understand the genetics, we may be able to understand brain development. If we understand brain development, we might begin to understand the complex interplay of environment and experience with genetics. And it gives us some concrete ability to, to treat kids who are severely affected uh, in the near term. Investing in research is tremendously important. It helps people know that there's a path forward. It helps get the best and the brightest. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation is invaluable in the field. This is our lifeblood. Without grant support, we don't move forward. We don't have labs. So they keep our research going. They bring new people into the field. They replenish the field. Having this kind of award, recognize commitment to science and, and to science and child psychiatry is really a wonderful thing and, and tremendously helpful. I started doing research in psychiatry because I was always a curious kid. I like, you know, detective movies and things like this. And when I started as a doctor to, to treat patients, I, I thought there were questions that were unanswered. Research would help me to expand the assistance and the help I could provide to my patients. My whole career has been devoted to understanding the causes and trying to improve the treatment of bipolar disorder. And many of the available treatments have been tested in our lab and with our patients. One of our findings relate to the combination of mood stabilizers with antipsychotics. Those who benefit, who may be around 60% of the population, are patients who do better, have a better outcome by receiving this combined treatment. And then I think uh, our group is recognized by the contribution with psychosocial therapies as well. Our work on psychoeducation has, I believe, contributed significantly to a better understanding of this condition, not only by doctors, but particularly by patients, by families, and by the society. I'm extremely honored to get this Colvin Prize. And uh, what it means to me is first, the recognition of my colleagues and peers in America. But moreover, I think the most important thing is that these kind of awards really help us to get uh, more resources and support for our research. This is a, a work that has uh, made a quite outstanding impact on the course and outcome of people living with this condition. Uh, my gratitude is immense. When I started in the field of child and adolescent psychiatry, there were very few treatments available for children that had mood disorders. Most of the treatments that were being used were those that were used for adults. Mood disorders take away the enjoyment of childhood. If there was something that I could do to help improve these children's lives, to help improve their mood, to help them to enjoy childhood, By about age five or six, a diagnosis of bipolar disorder or depression can be made. And it is crucial the earlier the diagnosis is made, the earlier there can be an intervention, the earlier treatment can be rendered with the aim of improving the quality of the child's life. My research focus has been on determining what medications can treat children that have depression and children that have bipolar disorder. Our studies were designed to help clinicians know what is the best choice of medication to make when they're faced with that decision. What medication do I pick to treat this child? It's a great honor to receive the Colvin Prize. Um, it is extremely prestigious in the field and I'm, I'm thrilled that um, I was selected for this award. If we could influence the future, if we could give this child a happy adulthood, that would be a tremendous accomplishment.